Welcome, everyone. Hi, everyone. Yeah. OK, so we're going to be talking a little bit about a polyglot developer experience on top of Kubernetes, that idea of having kind of like a Docker-less, Docker file-less, also a like YAML-less experience when you're building applications on top of Kubernetes. We will be talking a little bit about Knative. We will be talking a little bit about functions as well. So we are just going to go over a bunch of topics and just you know play a little game. Uh, my name is Mauricio Salatino. I do work for VMware, but my main responsibility nowadays is to work 100% of my time in Knative. I'm also writing a book that it's called Continuous Delivery for Kubernetes. You know there are like a couple of discounts there. If you're interested in that, just check the slides later on. I will be sharing that. And here I have Thomas with me. Yes, I work as a software architect at Systematic, a Danish software company. I am really passionate about anything cloud native. I'm also writing a book. It's called Cloud Native Spring in Action with Spring Boot and Kubernetes. Uh, I like contributing to open source, so it's really great uh, to be here and uh, sharing our passion and knowledge around all these open source projects. It's really great. Yeah, let's do it. So before we start the presentation, how many of you folks like joined the maintainers track before? Not so many, okay, a couple, great. So we will be playing a game today with all of you. It's uh, like, yeah, it's like a game that's running in a Kubernetes cluster, of course. And I wanted to show you what we are going to play at the end of the session so you kind of know how it will work. So this game, of course, it's been built using Knative and using functions, and it looked like this. We will be sharing kind of like the link to access the real application, this is just a demo, uh, where you can just generate a username and, and then just click play. And then it's just a quiz game, right? So you will be answering a couple of questions about Valencia and then interacting with some other questions that are you know, picking stuff and doing stuff. Well, something important there is that you have a timer there that it takes like 10 seconds. So you have like a timer there and you need to answer before that. If you answer, you save some seconds, you get some extra points for that. And then of course there are like questions that where you need to press buttons or copy texts and do different kind of things as well. You have like 10 seconds to answer that. Each of these levels in the, sec in, the, in the game, it's just basically a function. So there is a container that it's been bootstrapped in a Kubernetes cluster dynamically and based on demand, right? And we will be showing kind of like the architecture that we use for this game, which is pretty simple, but at the same time, it's, it's interesting. And we have learned a lot of very useful lessons. One of the things that I wanted to show you is that when you reach kind of like this final uh, screen, there should be here like a tweet button at the bottom that it's not showing up, but it, should, it will show up in your phones. And if you tweet and if you score high in the game, we are going to be sharing some swag and some stuff as well. So at the end, we all play together with that. Yeah, perfect. So let's start and see how we can build such a platform and such uh, a game on top of the platform. We're gonna start by talking uh, about serverless. When uh, uh, I say serverless, I specifically mean that I want to focus on uh, uh, the developer experience. I want to have developers focus on the business logic and push any kind of infrastructure or concerns down to the platform. So the platform is gonna take care of uh, provisioning the infrastructure necessary for uh, uh, our purpose, our business purpose. Uh, it's gonna manage the workloads that we deploy on Kubernetes and also it will handle dynamic scaling. So if I have more users or more uh, people playing the game, for example, I don't want to do anything manually or explicitly. I want the platform to take care of that and scaling out so to accommodate uh, the increase in uh, uh, the number of requests in coming into our system. And uh, one way of uh, building such a serverless platform on top of Kubernetes, what we're gonna use today, is based on Knative. A component within the Knative serving project, uh, it's, yeah, Knative serving. So it's uh, used to build a serverless experience on top of Kubernetes. So we are still dealing with Kubernetes resources. It's completely Kubernetes native. And we're gonna get, for starters, developer friendly abstractions. So instead of dealing with uh, uh, ingresses, services, deployments, replica sets, pods, we're gonna get one type of abstraction that the de developer is concerned with, and that's it. So we're gonna see it's a, a much, much easier for a developer to interact with such a platform. We get a, from code to URL experience. So I have my application, and then I want to get the URL where I can access my application running in Kubernetes. I don't want to deal with all the steps that are in between this process. I also want auto scaling, in particular also scaling to zero. If there's no request incoming, if there's no event, if there's no reason for my containers to be up and running, I don't want them to run. So scaling to zero is really great. Also uh, for cost optimization, of course, and uh, being more resource efficient. 
I, I also have the possibility to handle progressive rollouts. So via Knative, I can implement uh, deployment patterns. For example, I can have the, the blue-green deployments, I can do canary releases, all through the simple, single in, uh, abstraction that Knative Serving uh, exposes. It's all request-driven and event-driven. That's also what triggers the auto-scaling. It's based on the request or the events in coming into the system. And finally, it's cloud agnostic. You can run it on any Kubernetes distribution. But at this point, we can get this uh, container as a service experience. So we have a platform where we can provide just a container image, and then the platform takes care of the rest. But still, as a developer, I need to build that container image. And I don't want to do that uh, explicitly uh, uh, because first, I want to focus on the business logic if I'm a developer. And second, maybe I don't know all the details in order to build a production-ready image in terms of security, in terms of performance. That's why we like to use BuildPacks, uh, another CNCF project. With BuildPacks, we get a specification that converts application source code into container images, which are ready to go in production. So it's all based on a, a builder image, that's uh, what it's called, that uh, knows, so has knowledge about how to containerize in the best possible way uh, different kinds of applications implemented with different languages and different frameworks. So this means we don't have to write a Docker file. And it's also a great way for an enterprise to control the type of software that we put into production because this uh, uh, build packs, this is a specification, then uh, you need to choose an implementation. You can have one, we're gonna use the Paketo build packs, uh, an open source implementation of build packs, but you can have your own or control your own in your company so that, uh, for example, you can add your uh, compliance and security rules into the mechanism and make sure that all developers are using everything that is compliant with your company policies. So, let's see it running. I have built a, a very simple and small Go application here. It exposes an HTTP endpoint returning uh, a list of books. So the first thing I can do, I have already built a container image out of the, the application. So I can use the Knative CLI, KN. I can say KN service create. And then I give it a name, you make it on you. Yeah. Let's make it bigger, like that. Kubecon you uh, funk. Yes, K native funk. So we, we give it a name, like we would do with the Dogger CLI. Then I need to specify the image. I pushed it to my GitHub container registry, like that. And this is the name. And then I need to specify uh, the port number that I want to expose my application. I have an extra space there, like that. Oh yes, of course I have an extra space. Let's get rid of that. So the image name once again and the port number and that's it. So now the platform, Knative, takes this container image, it generates all the resources in Kubernetes uh, that are necessary to run my application, and will return a very convenient URL where I can access my application. So let's give it a try. I can say HTTP, send a GET request to the books endpoint, and I get back the list of books. So I started from a container image and I got it running in Kubernetes without having to write specific deployment service ingress configuration. Final part, how to build the container image. I can use the pack CLI from the build packs project. So I can say pack build. You are not in the director, right? And then uh, the builder, I have to specify a builder. I mentioned that for this presentation we are using the Paketo build packs implementation the builder image, and then I give the uh, container a name, for example, uh, book service. And that's it. Once I get the image, then I can go ahead and have Knative taking care of the rest. So if we are 
going to summarize this experience, what we have achieved so far. We started from uh, an application, I use Go. You could use Java, you could use .NET, it doesn't matter, because once we use build packs, build packs can, t can take any kind of application with different languages and frameworks and build an image. And to do that, we use the pack CLI. Once we have a container image, then Knative does the rest. I can use, for example, the KN CLI to do that and deploy the application in a Kubernetes cluster. Final part, I get back a URL, a public URL, where I can consume the application. But still, this approach is really great. I can use it for any kind of workload. But there are uh, two things that we can improve. First, we can automate even more this process, so to improve the developer experience when using such a platform. And second, since now we have these serverless capabilities and scale to zero features provided by Knative, we can start talking about functions. Let's do that. So what Thomas has showed is basically the process of a development, you know, like a development team just creating software and then just packaging that, containerizing it, and then running it into Kubernetes cluster. Kennedy is doing a lot there to, to, you know, to simplify that experience, providing some CLI tools. If you need to do the same using YAML files, you will have like shorter and smaller YAML files that you can use as well. When you start thinking about improving the developer experience, you need to ask why and kind of like what kind of use cases do you want to implement. Functions and building functions as a service platforms provide that kind of like simplification for certain kind of workloads and certain kind of applications. So we will be looking at this more specific use case of building a platforms that is just targeting these function developers. So when you are dealing with functions, you are dealing with a different programming model. It's just a different way of building applications and solving problems. Uh, initially, like functions are going to be triggered by requests or events in, that are happening in the, in the platform or in the, in the infrastructure or out, even outside of your company. Functions tend to be more stateless and they are very, very focused on doing a single thing, right? Like in the game example that we showed, each function in this case is analyzing some input and then just producing some scores. And it's kind of like, it's generally the case that uh, you can build functions and then you can write unit tests for these functions that are going to validate that the function is doing what it's doing. Usually you tend to build, you know, integration testing across multiple functions, but not for a single function, which is kind of like a nice uh, simplified way of, of building applications. When you talk about functions, you are also being uh, start like hearing about cold starts. That basically means that because now the platform is uh, dealing with the scaling up and scaling down the application, our functions, the, the programs that we are building, needs to quickly start so the platform, you know, don't leave the ones that are creating requests like hanging there and waiting for the container to start. So functions frameworks are optimized just to make sure that, you know, these functions, these containers can be started fast. And because we can scale down to zero when we are building with fun when we are working with functions, uh, you know, we can just start saving some money because functions that are not being used are completely downscaled. They are not running in the cluster, and the platform will take care of just starting them when we are getting kind of like requests. So when we, again, when we, talk, when we start working with functions, you definitely need to change the way that you design and, and you know, implement the applications. And you tend to have like two different in, like, you know, interaction patterns with functions. You have like the synchronous side of things, where you can interact with the function sending an HTTP request, and then you know, the function will do something, but you are not interested in the response. So we just let it work there, you know that it will put data somewhere and then the application can continue from there. You have a more like a request response approach where you just call the function and then you need to wait to get the results back to continue processing. Remember the game, we are evaluating the inputs from an answer and then we, we are creating a score and then we are sending the score back to the user interface. In that case, we are using that pattern. And then when you're using request response or fire and forget, you also most of the time I would say 90% of the time, you need to go and interact with some kind of external storage, right? Because functions are stateless, they are not storing a state, so you might need to go out and say, and write something to a database or read stuff from the database. And that, you know, and that will influence the way that you design your functions. Because again, if you are like using request response where you need to wait for the results, then latency becomes a thing. You can switch also to the asynchronous way of doing things, most, mostly related with events, right? Like you can have functions that are going to react to events that are happening in the platform or coming from outside. And in that case, functions are just going to react there. You don't need to call them and they will do something and at the end they will probably produce another event that another function can use. Uh, building event-based functions and using Knative, uh, something that we will be showing here like with Thomas, uh, it's pretty easy, it's pretty natural and straightforward and it's also integrated into the platform. 
So when you're building these kind of functions, you also need to rely on the platform providing some constructs so you can wire functions together. And then you ended up in building these event-driven applications where you, know, you have functions creating, consuming events, emitting events, and other functions you know, reacting to them. And by that, you just create like, more complex logic and more complex behaviors. So what I wanted to show now, it's basically expanding on the demo that uh, Thomas showed. I want to use something that we call in KNative the func CLI. So this is another CLI provided by the KNative project that basically allows you to start building functions from, from scratch, right? So I will just do here, um, I need to learn to type. So kubecon func, I will just create a function directory here, uh, func. So if I go to that directory, uh, what I can do is I can use um, the func CLI just to run this command. And in this case, again, I'm choosing Go as a language because we are in KubeCon. We, I guess that everybody's familiar with Go. But again, here is where you can just choose Java. You can use you know, dot, .NET. You can use uh, Node, Rust, and all the things. And here, like the template here, the last HTTP that I'm, I'm calling here, it's basically the interaction way, right? I want to send an HTTP request to my function so it can do something. I can also choose like the cloud event based approach for listening to events if I want to. What I have here, if I open this into my IDE, is just the template, like the initial template for a function where I can just go there basically and code my, my business logic, right? So let me show you quickly how does that look like. This is pretty simple code. It also has like a test already, like a unit test there, so you don't forget about writing tests. And it basically tells you like, you know, every time that you, you get a request, then this is kind of like where you need to write the logic for that request. And I will say, hello, KubeCon, from a function. Today is my birthday, so this is my birthday gift. Today is my birthday. There you go. So if you write that kind of function, pretty simple stuff, the next thing that you can do is to go to the terminal and then run a single command here, deploy, just to run this function in my Knative cluster, right? And I can use the verbose approach so we can see what happens. Let's see if this works. Uh, the first thing that it asks, of course, because we are going to containerize this, we need to push this to a Docker registry, and I will be using Thomas here, Thomas registry in GitHub, container registry.io, and then, uh, yeah, so that's his registry. We have already the credentials configured for that registry. And what Funk is going to do basically here is it's going to use Paketo build packs, as he showed before, just to understand in which language this function is created, create a container for it, and then we are going to push that container to, you know, to, to GitHub container registry in this case. You can see that it's installing Go there in the container. It's going to uh, download all dependencies that my function needs, create a container with different layers, and then push that to a registry. When all that happens, the next step is going to be to deploy that into the cluster using something similar that, like, like what we saw before with KN, right? That it's just deploying a container into the KNN cluster, and at the end of the you know, at the end of this execution, we should be able to get like a URL for my function. We are building kind of like different layers for different use cases. So the developer experience is, it gets easier and easier. And in this case, we are using the function programming model in order to make it like way easier. Again, just using a function CLI, you just get stuff up and running. While this is running, I'm just pushing now, I think they're pushing to the repository. Yeah, that's pushing to the repository. It should take uh, a couple of more seconds. But it's important to understand that what we are building there in Funk, in the, in the functions project inside Knative, is also an experience where you, will, you might have developers that doesn't have Docker installed in their laptop. So all this building process can also happen remotely in the cluster. Right? So I can trigger this build process remotely. It will use Tecton in the cluster. If you have Tecton installed in the cluster, it will use Tecton. And it will build and deploy everything remotely. So you as a developer just work with Go, start the function locally, play around with it, and when you're ready, you trigger the build lock remotely, and it will deploy, do the deployment there in the cluster. So now it's just deploying the function into the cluster, and then, as you can see here, we have the URL, which is, of course, uh, the thing that we just created. So if I do an HTTP request here for that function, I should be able to get the function that I've just built. Yep. Yeah, that was really great. So if you're wondering what's happening in the cluster, so how, we are, how are we deploying this, uh, I'll quickly show you that developer-friendly abstraction I mentioned earlier. So what Funk and also the KN CLI does is creating uh, these 11 lines of YAML, so where you just define the container port, the image name, and then Knative takes care of the rest. Yep. So what we achieved so far, let's uh, recap. Oh, 
We have yes. one. Well, yeah, so quick, quick mentions about like the Kennedy uh, functions products, right? Like, as I show you, I just created a function from scratch. You usually will not do that. Like, I was creating a game, creating different levels, and I can quickly create like a template, like a more advanced template that connects to Redis and do more, more things pretty easily, like from a remote repository. We support multiple languages and frameworks, as I, we said before. You can also run the function locally. That will basically start the Docker container locally if you want to play around with it uh, for a bit. I mentioned the own cluster builds, and we are working on defining what 1.0 for this project means, and we, that will probably go out this year. So if you're interested in contributing to this project, please reach out because there are tons of things that we need to do there. And I think that it's a pretty easy project to get started with because, you know, no matter the language that you know, you will be able to help there. Yes, and as a developer, it's a great experience because now we have a way to bootstrap uh, our project with Funk Create. Uh, we could use different languages and frameworks and even build our own templates in order to quickly start a, a project based, for example, on our company uh, uh, guidelines and policies. We can use Funk Deploy. So now the two operations that earlier I did manually with the PAC CLI and the KN CLI, now they are combined and uh, taken care of by Funk Deploy. And once again, the image uh, will be uh, run as containers inside the cluster. I get the URL back, and that's really great. I get auto-scaling. I didn't have to write any Docker file, any YAML file. But still, we have something missing because we're talking about serverless, and functions, we mentioned event-based uh, applications. Mm -hmm. So we should talk a bit about events. So the first thing, we talk about events. We are uh, in this uh, uh, cloud-native world. We are in a Kubernetes cluster. Events really can come from many different sources. So the first problem we need to solve is how we exchange those events across different, uh, possibly very different systems. And uh, one of the CNCF projects uh, solves this problem, cloud events, is a specification to define how we exchange data in the cloud. And this is for interoperability reasons. So it doesn't matter the technology or the stack that we use, but we can uh, uh, always understand and exchange cloud events. And we have a standard. We have a standard in the cloud to uh, do event-based architectures. This is uh, how a cloud event looks like. We have some metadata. Uh, that we use, for example, to route those events in different systems. And the data, so the payload could be anything. It could be a JSON object, but you could even wrap, for example, AMQP messages that you use in your uh, RabbitMQ cluster or Kafka MQTT. So it's, it's really a powerful concept. So th it's not a protocol. It's a, a format uh, for exchanging this data in the cloud as events. But then you can use whatever protocol you want. Cloud events is uh, the base for Knative eventing. This is another component within the Knative project that uh, allows to build event-driven architectures. We have a few different features here. Once again, we have very developer-friendly abstractions that I'll show, uh, uh, we'll show in a second. We can build these event-driven architectures. And the project itself takes care of routing. So we have a, a broker abstraction, and then we could uh, plug any kind of event source that uh, we might have. It's uh, polyglot support with different uh, technologies and languages because it's based on cloud events. So as long as we understand uh, cloud events, then we can interact with the system. It's pluggable, as I said. So if you have your RabbitMQ cluster, your Kafka, you can have events coming from a, a Twitter stream, for example, or from Slack. You can do that as well because through this abstraction, then we talk cloud events across the entire system, independently from uh, what is the specific technology we are using uh, at the lower level. Once again, this is cloud agnostic. So it runs on any uh, Kubernetes cluster. You don't need to have Knative serving to use Knative eventing also. There are two separate uh, uh, projects. You can run them both. We are running both uh, of them in our game architecture, but you can choose depending on your requirements. So if we recap after adding the event part, in the cluster we have something extra. So we don't have only Knative serving installed, we also have Knative eventing. And because of that, we can define a Knative broker abstraction. The Knative broker then can uh, collect and route events across different uh, sources and destinations. And within the cluster, we identify the destinations or the listeners uh, via triggers. So if we want to create a function listening to some events, 
we use the good old fun create again, but this time we also specify a trigger so that uh, this function should listen to specific events. And then again, we can use the language that we want. Cloud Events has uh, uh, SDKs uh, supporting uh, different languages and frameworks. We use func deploy, and we get a URL back. So from a developer point of view, same uh, very uh, friendly experience. But now we are also doing event-driven on top of serverless. Pretty good. And let's see now how we used all of this in our game. Yeah? Yeah. Let's do a quick uh, like review of the architecture that it's pretty simple, but at the same time, we have learned some very good lessons by just building it. And I think that the main lesson for us is like, if you are not used to build function-based applications, then you, again, need to start changing the mindset. We have a very simple architecture, and we build kind of like the idea of a game where you can just add as many levels as you want. So it's pretty dynamic on the front end. The front end can support as many levels as you want as soon as you have a user interface. And then each level is a function, as we mentioned before. The interactions, uh, the interactions between you know, the front end and the functions are very basically driven by this you know, orchestrator component in there that knows which functions to call next based on the level that you are playing in, right? And all the interactions are HTTP based in the sense that like it just basically the same as I did before, right? Like in order to interact with the level, you need to send an HTTP request. That's a synchronous request. And because the level is storing data in Redis, when you send that request, you need to wait for the data to be stored in Redis in order to be able to have you know, the response back in the user. There are techniques to avoid doing that, of course, but we wanted to keep it really, really simple to see how that kind of like works out when we all play here together. And what we did next is because, again, we have event, like, and we have Knative Eventing installed, we can expand the, the, you know, the application to start basically emitting events and consuming events for a more reactive experience. So we, what we did is we built a, a leaderboard that we will be putting in the screen here that is consuming events that are being created by all the, you know, every level. Every time that you finish a level, you are going to be sending a cloud event to a broker, which is, again, one of these routers. And it's going to be, you know, we have a trigger defined so we can send, you know, the event back to the user interface. And inside the user interface, we are using our socket to propagate that event back to my browser, right? In this case, you need to connect and route things across different components so I can get, you know, kind of like push notifications on my side, and, and we will get those in the screen in a bit. So by building this, we can wire these cloud events, and we can route these cloud events, for example, to other functions, or if, we, for, for example, we want to get rid of, like, writing synchronously to Redis, we can have another function that picks these, you know, score events, and then do, like, the writes in an asynchronous fashion as well. So it gets kind of like quite complex, and we are aiming to have this example for you to run in your own laptops or in your own clusters if you want to, because at the end of the day, we are kind of like using the same concepts again and again. And I yes. think that before we play, we will just set up the game a yes. bit. We just need to Let's run a couple of that. commands first. And then we'll have some fun. And then we will just be playing all together. The idea here is that, again, every time that you play with the, with the game, that basically will mean that there is a function instance being created on the backend. And we can just see that uh, kind of like in real life. But we, also be able, we will be also getting kind of like all the cloud events here in the leaderboard that we will be showing in the screen. But first, we will just share this. So if you have your phone with you, and if you want to scan kind of like the QR code here, do you have the, yeah? yeah? Yes. Let's cool. set it up. So let's do it, because we have another couple of minutes left. Yes. We have no Wi-Fi or something like oh, that. Oh, yes. Is that the problem? Yeah. <laughs> Classic. Classic. It's like we are just breaking the cloud. You see? Huh. Do you want to put the game up, at least, the QR? Because I'm pretty sure that folks... Yes, you let's can... start doing that. Yeah. So if you want to open you know, the game, and let's hope that the Wi-Fi works, there you go. Look at all the phones up. Let's put it big, please. Uh, yes, actually, we have Wi-Fi. Just a sec. Yeah, there you go. So if you open that, if the QR code doesn't work, you can enter that you know, URL. It should take you to the same place. Apologize for not being able to show the leaderboard, but the Wi-Fi, it's not working as we expected. It was working before you all entered the room, yes. as you can imagine. <laughs> this is how it goes. That one, yes. Yes. But we don't uh, have like a... Yeah, adapter. Do we have an adapter? This one? Uh, there yes. you go. Yes. Okay, let's plug it in. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, we're in. Are we in? There you go. Live demos, everyone. Running on Kubernetes. No Wi Fi. There you go. <laughs> All right. Let's see if it works. So, do we have it? And drum rolls. Drum rolls. No. <laughs> There you go. OK, we have some people playing at least. That's very good. Yes, if you haven't scanned the QR code, there you here go. it is again. And you can Let's see. Let's do like this. Yeah, the events popping up. You see, all those cloud events are you folks just playing there. So I think that, again, like just to recap a little bit, we just try to build a platform where the main construct is a function. We show that in the architecture, when you're building this kind of applications, if you are doing sync functions, you need an orchestrator to define which function to call next. But you can also build event-driven applications. Look at those so notifications. Many That's great. You are going to cost us a lot of money. <laughs> Look at that. How many people is there? So all, all of these are cloud events. We, we got them via our socket. A binary reactive protocol that we're using in the front end. Wow, there's so many That's events nice. coming in. This is awesome. Thanks for playing with us. Look at how many players. Oh, 300 players. Folks, I think that that's pretty much it. Yeah, remember to tweet your score. If you tweet the score, there are some prizes. We will be calculating the winners later on. But I think that that's pretty much it, my friend, right? Yes. Uh, yep. Yeah, we will share the slides. You'll find uh, also links to our uh, GitHub repository, so you can run this example on your cluster, even locally. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much, folks. I, I think that we have like a couple of minutes for questions. There yes. are two microphones here. You know, if you want we to ask any question, please feel free to approach us as well uh, or follow us there on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.